there's an old joke, but it's a joke with a good point to it. See, there was this fellow who was walking down one of the New York streets at night. It's a dangerous thing to do nowadays. When I was a kid, it was okay. Well, he was walking down the streets, and sure enough, a fellow comes up to him with a gun, and he points the gun at him, and he says, I'm willing to use this. So the guy says, okay, I'll give you all my money. He says, I don't want your money. He says, what do you want? He says, sit down. He sits down. He says, so what do you want? He says, listen, I've been looking for someone to listen to me for the last five years. Nobody will spend any time. You're going to listen for one hour. You ever hear that one? But it is a comment on the human condition. Perhaps you can reflect back to yourself. You got anybody listening to you? Do you want to be listened to? Is there a loneliness in you? Conversation is our tool to be in contact with other human beings, not alone. You need that. Human beings have to be with others. Not the bowling game, not to watch television together, yeah, but to be with them, to communicate. So how do we go about this? We're up to number 20 of the 48 ways. Number 20 of the list is the miut sicho. Miut means to minimize. Sicho is conversation. So number one is that you've got to appreciate that one time things were a lot better. You've got to become aware that the art of conversation was once a fine art, taught, admired. They used to have salons. Did you ever have a salon? The stars of society were good conversationalists. If you landed, not a Joe DiMaggio, but I don't remember the names of those people, but for your salon, then you made the big leagues. Salons were where a topic was discussed. There was a topic for the evening. One time, human beings found this the source of entertainment. Now, what happened? Today, if you invite people over for an evening, a social evening, then what do you do? You have a canned videotape that uh, they all wanted to see again, right? Or you watch a football game, and you munch in between, boy, that was a good play, or you, know, you go out on a date, you go to a movie, and you watch a show, right? Today, we are passive. We want to be entertained. Who's got time to talk? Yeah. No, who's got time to talk? You've got a Sunday Times, that's the end of the day. Yeah. See of this is, it's pervaded even the family. Brothers, sisters, parents, man and wife don't talk together. They don't have conversation. And that's tragedy. Isolated in your own home. So, number two is, change your attitude. Try talking to people. Say hello. You don't know where to take it. It's okay. You won't die. Talk to your people in the office. Talk to your acquaintances. Say hello. Say how are you. And see if it'll go any further. Don't be afraid. Try, try again. You'll learn how. Nobody will shoot you for saying hello. Does that make sense? It's painful because you don't know what where to go from there. But you'll learn how. So be of this is, especially in those times you're on a plane and you read the magazines, now you reread it because there's nothing else on the plane to do. Now there's a guy sitting next to you. Yeah. What will happen? What are you afraid of? Say hello. Ask him where you're from, where you're going. Get into a conversation. Notice that there's a fear. What's the fear? Rejection. I won't have a smart thing to say. The guy will get bored with me after the first five minutes. I'll never see him again. You're going to send a letter back to your home. I met your your son on the plane, and it was very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. It's a fear of strangeness. Yeah. Number three is that a better way is defined with clarity. What are you after? What is conversation? That's the essence of Judaism. You know what you want to do, you'll figure out how to do it. So, A of this is, first, let's see the difference between conversation and discussion. Discussion is not an argument, but it is a confrontation of opinions, right? Conversation is just report to me how you feel. It's just getting to another human being's feelings about life. Never mind whether you're right or you're wrong, whether I'm buying or I'm not buying. How do you feel about democracy? Do you think life is beautiful? Honest, tell me. 
I'll tell you how I feel about it. Is that an interesting point? That's what conversation is about. It is not to confront someone and tell them you're all wet, you're wrong, life is a drag. No, no. See, maybe you'll think it over, maybe he has something, he, then you'll negate it, he's making a mistake, you see how people make mistakes. You're isolated in your own opinion, you don't even hear yourself. When you talk to someone else, you'll hear yourself too. You'll get your feelings about life. You're not even asking yourself. You're frozen. You're not interested in information like who won the last series and uh, what's the price of gold on the market. That's not a conversation. That's information shop. Yeah? You want to get to their feelings, to their life quotients. What they think about life, about living, about love, about war, about meaning, about existence, etc. Their inner appreciations of what living is about. You're talking to your wife. Conversation is how she's feeling. What she thinks about living. Whether she enjoys life. What upsetting her about the day. That's conversation. And that's what you've got to get to. And that's what she has to express and what you have to relate to. You have to know where she is. That's what conversation is really about. All right, number four is learn how to go about it. And some of them are very obvious. Never ask somebody, do you think life is beautiful? Do you ever think of committing suicide? Right. You kind of warm up. you got to show your credentials. No harm. No shalom alaykum. No, no weapon. Yeah. So how do you do that? You say, where you're from? What's your name? And how did you enjoy it? Yeah, this is throwaway. You know, this is just credential exchange. And you're not out to harm them. Even if you're dying to know, how did he feel about being in prison for 25 years? <laughs> huh? That's not the first question you ask. You've got to sort of build up first. <laughs> you can't really have a conversation with someone that you, you're you indifferent to. You've got to focus on something that's likable about this person and that you respect in this person. And he's a human being, something. You've got to find something to hang it on. If you don't, if you're talking to someone that you're indifferent to, the conversation is an indifferent conversation. The vibes are no good, and it will go nowhere. So, remember a man's first name and his last name. A lot of times we just lose his name in introduction, right? And then we're talking to someone that's faceless, and we feel a little uncomfortable about the whole thing, and it, it wrecks your conversation. You're focused on to one human being. He's real when you know his name. It sounds ridiculous. What's the difference? It is a difference. A good listener is a good conversationalist. You say, but I want to express myself. Yeah, well, you can think for yourself. How do you feel about the subject later or on the spot? You don't have to tell him. A good conversationalist can say five words in an hour and learn an awful lot. B of this is that focus the conversation is not to impress or to be liked, but to learn about others. That's our most common mistake. Avoid that mistake. Don't impress someone. You talk to the guy in the plane, don't let him know by the end of the trip how many trophies you won and what your honors in college were, etc., etc. That's not the point. The point is that you know all about his thinking about life, about existence. You've gotten to know him. All right, number five is that one word, the uh, best piece of advice I can give you to be an excellent conversationalist is be fascinated. If you're fascinated with human beings, you are an excellent conversationalist. When you're fascinated, people will start talking and they won't stop. They'll tell you things that you could never, you never imagine people will tell you. My mother, the blessed memory, used to be a fantastic conversationalist. We go, I remember one trip, we took a bus from the Lower East Side to Park Avenue uh, to a doctor's visit. She talked to a black woman there and and uh, I heard about her husband and her children, and I, I mean, I, just, I was fascinated. Yeah? <laughs> she talked to a truck driver. It was a long trip. A truck driver, and I'd heard all about his trip through the United States. You know, and I was fascinated by. But she was a fantastic conversation. She was fascinated with people. She would never would stop for a moment. She'd say hello. You just hung around her. You'd hear fantastic things that nobody ever told me in the life. B of this is that if you can't be fascinated, at least give it your full attention. Focus completely. 
It's almost as good as being fancy. And don't look around. Don't think of other things. Pay attention. All right, number six is, so how to be fascinated. A of this is that, can you imagine you're walking down the street and you see a dog and the dog says, hello, how are you? Huh? Are you fascinated? Immediately, right? You're not going to say, yeah, fine. Bye-bye. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to say to the dog? Where are you from? <laughs> How'd you learn how to speak? Do you have any other word? Oh, well, you look around first to see whether there's uh, any more. Huh? Now tell me, what do you really think you're going to learn from a dog? Well, really, I mean, after he's talked it all out, you know, what are they going to talk about? A dog's life? <laughs> no. But we're fascinated because it is new, intriguing, mystery. So B of this is focus on the fact that every human being is a mystery. Every one of them. People want to know themselves. When you ask them questions and they answer, they're learning about themselves. If I ask you, what do you think about life? Is life beautiful, boring, struggle? What would you say? Do you see that you start thinking about yourself? And you want to know yourself, but it's too much. I mean, what do I think about life? But for a conversation, huh? for another human being, you reach in, you examine, you start thinking, you start self-discovery. And this is therapeutic. <laughs> Instead of paying a psychiatrist, you understand? This is a way of helping other human beings. They're alone. Number seven is, you can't just sit there passive and be fascinated. You've got to use your mind to see what is it that's interesting. You know? Just listening to people will put you to sleep. So, for example, if you ask somebody, what do you think about war? You know what the answer will be. War is terrible. Right? Maybe there's one guy in a thousand will say, and you say, yeah, what are you talking about? Right? Might be a little afraid to get into too deep a conversation with him. Yeah, but <laughs> Wow. Right? But everybody's going to say, war is terrible. Well, do you think the war between Iran and Iraq is terrible? No. <laughs> I mean, my father... <laughs> if there's a gang coming out to beat you up, yeah, and they start fighting amongst themselves, you say, thank God. Right? And we look at Iraq and Iran as, uh, as enemies of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And if they fight between themselves, we say, thank God, you know, keep at it. Have a long war, a successful war. <laughs> if, that, if that's your attitude. <laughs> but the conversation, the interest in the conversation is to ask people that, like, why are you fascinated with war stories? Do you follow the war? What's fascinating about it? If you think it's terrible. The idea is to use your mind at an angle in a, in a, in a, where you are interested in another human being's thoughts and feelings and to share it. Otherwise, you use the set-piece conversation and it'll very easily get into a boring, no-end, dead-end discussion. Yeah? B of this is that realize in everything, practice makes perfect. Learn how and you will do it. Uh, i give you again the example when you started out driving a car. You remember going out into traffic? Remember the first time you're driving a car and the, sitting and the guy next to you wanted to make conversation with you? You say, what do you want to get us killed? There's a car coming down two blocks down the street. Don't you see? you got to prepare. When I was a student in Baltimore, I used to hitch. So one time I hitched a ride with a guy from uh, some southern town. It's going up to New York, and we're coming through Baltimore, and got this ride. And as we came to the Holland Tunnel, and the traffic got heavier and heavier and heavier, he pulled over to the side, and he said, you know how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me to drive to this hotel, and I was a young kid, maybe uh, 18 years old, you know. First time I had a Cadillac. <laughs> <laughs> The point over here is that when we start, we think we'll never make it. We can't make it. And even a guy who's been driving, but he never saw this traffic, he, he's frozen. He actually stopped and asked and asked me. I don't know how he got out of the city. Maybe he hired a driver to get him out into the, uh, into the highway. I don't know what, 
What happened? Maybe he got his courage after he saw me driving there. I don't know. But you understand that until you get a little practice, you figure it can't be done. Okay, number eight is that use directly for living. What planning should you do? You're going to Europe. Come on. Aren't there people around who've, who've toured Europe? You should find out. What is it about? Is it worth the trip? Well, people are constantly going. It could be they're constantly going because the word hasn't gotten back yet. Because nobody talks about it. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, you know you went to some rat trap of a hotel because nobody gave you the word. So you're going to Europe. Find out what fellows who were there before, what did they learn? What did they gain? What was it like? What was interesting? What made it worthwhile? Does that make sense that when you're doing something, get into it, find out about it? Yeah? Now you're planning to get married, right? Looking at marriages, some look good, some look miserable, yeah, right? You ever got a little trepidation? Do you know any married people? Ask him what marriage is like. Well, what am I going to say? I'm going to ask him what marriage is like. Huh? Well, use your head a little bit. Huh? What do you like about marriage? <laughs> what are the problems? You can get the drift. Do you follow? What are the solutions? That's planning. You're going to have children. Well, what are you going to do? Each one of us. I'm, I'm telling you, in this generation, one time, everybody shared, what do you do with your children? What do you do with a, 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 a child that doesn't want... Everybody shared. One time you got advice from 75 people, yeah? Today, everyone is in his own little corner, yeah? And he struggles himself, or he reads a book on child uh, training and child, uh, you know. Right? Ask your mother or your father or uh, a friend. You don't do that. Come on, have conversation. Find out what are the problems, what are the solutions, what are the possibilities, what are the pleasures. You know somebody who set himself up in business, went out looking for a job, you're worrying about yourself, about looking for a job. Yeah. How does he go about it? How do he feel? How do he overcome his fears? Right? Talk! Do you see that this is a tool for living that's so ridiculous not to use it? Number uh, nine is focus directly on your wisdom and your wisdom and your experiences for yourself. What do I think about this idea of... Uh, of people being lonely and helped by conversation, that we have to get out of ourselves, that human beings are fascinating. What do I think about it afterwards? If someone asked me, what do I think about the 48 ways, about being an yeshiva, about that we have an obligation to have pleasure? Do you understand? Ask yourself the questions that other people, in order to get your own reaction. It's hard for us to make decisions, valid or not valid, but at least get in touch with your feelings on the subject. What would you answer? B of this is, of course, it's a heck of a lot easier to take a partner. Ask the same questions that you'd like to ask for yourself. Ask the other guy, tell me, why don't you make a list of your pleasures? You know, the rabbi said, that's the biggest mistake we make. Why don't you do it? He'll say, why don't you do it? Say, look, friend, I want to know why you don't do it, so maybe I'll figure out why I don't do it. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> No fight, no no criticism, just let's discover what's going on. Should we know our pleasures? So ask that guy, he'll ask you. You, 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 you puzzle it out. Get in touch with what's going on. That's the easiest. Yeah. All right, number nine is that an excellent way for interesting conversations and growth and wisdom is to relate your feelings to pieces of wisdom to other people and sound them out. In other words, if you have significantly changed while you're in a yeshiva, don't come home and tell him, look, I will tell you about life. Happiness is an obligation. This is the definition of love. This is the way to live. They'll throw you out of the house. Yeah. Don't do that. But what you do is, you say, you know, I was completely perplexed when I heard that love is an obligation. I thought it was an outrage. Yeah. How do you feel about it? Right? Then, when you report your reaction, they'll report their reaction, you'll find you'll have fascinating conversations. You follow, when you give someone your reaction, a piece of wisdom, you're into it, and you're in fast and furious, and you got something going for you, you can make a conversation. So be of this is that realize, when you get back, if you significantly have changed while you were in a yeshiva, don't tell them, yes, I know, 
or this is the way it is. Say, it seems to me, this is the way I feel about it. I would really like to know how you feel about it. It seems to me that a human being should know what he's living for. It's a top priority. What do you want out of life? Is a top, that's the way it seems to me. What do you say? Don't tell them you've got to know what you're living for. They'll say, come on, get off that trip. Yeah? You get that? But if you say, it seems to me, I really feel that way. What do you feel? Not that I'm telling you the truth, but what do you feel? Return to me your feelings and be interested in your feelings. Remember, never tell people anything. People don't want you to tell them nothing. You say, seems to me, this is the way I feel about it. How do you feel about it? That's the way to have one of these conversations when it is a confrontation. Yeah? No confrontation. I want to know your feelings. Your feelings are legitimate. My feelings are legitimate. Let's exchange feelings. Right? And uh, the same thing goes if, if, if somebody puts anything on you. You tell them, look, it seems to me that what you're doing is, uh, is, is not according to the Jewish way of doing things. Yeah? What do you think? Yeah? Instead of fighting, don't fight with people. Yeah? And the negative is, number one, don't talk to no purpose. Don't just wave your mouth. So, number two of this is that in order to avoid no purpose talk, then what do you got to do? You got to ask yourself, is there any point to this conversation? Am I going anywhere? Where, where am I going? Am I learning something about the person? Am I, is something that's worthwhile? Am I learning about life? Am I gaining some information? Are we making contact? Ask yourself. Is there any point to it? Number three is that once you've asked yourself, then you've got to take it a step further and struggle to end no purpose talk. You've got to make that decision. You see, after you ask yourself, it's still you're not out of it. So number four is that it's best to be prepared beforehand how to switch conversations, have a way of turning it around into something that you are interested in. In the middle of a conversation, but I was just talking to you about the last football game we had last season. Yeah, but this has been plaguing me. Please help me out. Yeah? The guy says, oh, you're in trouble. Let me think about it. Well, so you've got a few of these lines, and you're plagued by the happiness game. You're plagued by the fact that we don't love each other, and we don't know each other. Well, whatever it is, yeah? And whenever you've got into a conversation that's boring, that's going nowhere, that just pull it out, put it on the table, and switch it around. Now, if someone's telling you about their troubles, and there's no way you can help them, if you can help them, you have an obligation. But there's no way, you know, that's the hypochondriac ant or the uh, all-time loser who wants to tell you the... Right? So then the, the way of saying is that, listen, I'm willing to talk to you, and fine and everything, and you're my brother, you're my aunt, you're my sister, you're my friend, yeah? But before we talk any further, give me... Ten major pleasures that you have in life. Yeah. Says I got no pleasure in life. You say, well, would you rather have not have eyes, or do eyes do something for you? Uh, did you ever enjoy using your eyes? Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to point out one major pleasure and and ask him if there's anything better. All right. Uh, number five is that look. There's some recalcitrant souls that uh, you can try with the best techniques. You can't get them onto a meaningful conversation. So what you should have is graceful exit lines ready. You see? Say, oh, I'm very sorry, I have an appointment. <laughs> I forgot. Look, there's one more thing. The number six is, I'd like to tell you, you see, that Jewish consciousness was, and this used to be widespread, and there's still are little pockets of it, that human beings... When they found themselves talking too much, you know what they would do? They'd take one day, no talk. No conversation at all. No small talk. They would still study. I remember when I came to, to Israel and I saw a couple of kids in Elul, the month before Rosh Hashanah, and they're waving at each other and they're pointing and this and that. I didn't know what the heck was going on, you know. Until I realized it was a tiny dibu they had accepted on themselves that they don't talk. They don't talk for a whole day. Try it. It's a fantastic, healthy experience. 
Now, if you want to do it today at one time, all you had to do was say like this, you know, people knew where, what you were doing, yeah? But today, you have to have a little sign, learn Chinese. Otherwise, they'll think you're nuts, you know, but they'll wonder about it. They'll, they'll wait until the day, experiment, no talking today, yeah? And then, uh, they come back the next day, you have a real topic of conversation <laughs> as to what, what, what you were doing. But you'll find it very healthy. Okay, uh, Roman numeral three is the cutting down conversation. So cutting down means that uh, stay alert. You got to choose your words. You got to cut out the fact. Be concise. The same thing. It's an interesting, it's worthwhile conversation, but to the point. Be concise. Number two of this is practice framing your thoughts, framing your words. Stop for a moment and frame what you're going to say before saying it. That's very difficult. People think, what are you doing? Yeah, but first figure out what do you want to say, how am I going to say it, and then say it. We start talking, and somebody says, well, how do you feel about this subject? You say, well, I think, uh, and while we're talking, we start thinking, right? That's not good. Stop for a moment. Think about it. And think about the words you're going to use in order to convey this message, whatever you want to convey. Does that make sense? Then you're, then you're planning the conversation, right? Okay, why do we need this? Number one is we're in a narcissistic envelope, self-enclosed, we're tight, we're stifling. Conversation is to reach out, to see that there are other human beings, not to be alone. We're suffering in that envelope. You understand that? Conversation is our tool to feel other human beings, to touch them. We can be alone even with our parents, even with our brothers and sisters, all alone, unless we learn how to make conversation, to be interested in them, to express ourselves. Then we're not alone anymore. And we need to be with others. Number two of why do we need positive conversation is that wisdom is what human beings, what life is about. Human beings are wisdom. Living is wisdom. They have it. You've got to learn that. That's what the Torah will teach you. That's what you can learn from human beings. They know. They've lived. <coughs> they might make mistakes, etc., but human beings have wisdom. Get it. Roman numeral two is the negative. Talk substitutes for reality. We, we're bored with living. We, we, we make a telephone call, and it's an escape hatch. Substitutes for reality. Talk about something. Brag about something instead of doing it. So don't use conversation as an escape. Cut out unnecessary conversation. Because he who escapes today will live to escape another day. He who runs away today will live to run another day. Number two of this is that unnecessary talk is stupid. You understand? Say silly things, you're silly. It dulls your mind. It dulls your critical abilities. You've got to be sharp all the time if you want to be sharp. So get to the point, concise, to the meaning. Roman numeral three, the positive and negative is when you think before you speak, you connect your mind to your words, you're really into where you are, what you want to say, your intelligence is connected with your living patterns rather than being separated by the gap of knowing what you're talking about. You've got to think before you speak. Connect your words with your mind rather than let your mouth run away and then try to catch up with your mind. <laughs> As an assignment, I would say, come on, fellas, ask ten guys, what do they think about living? Is life beautiful? Come on, try it out. You've got ten guys over here. Ask them, what do you think? Is life beautiful? And report to them. They'll ask you, right? Report to them, what do you think? Get in touch with it ten different times. Find it fast. You have been listening to the 48 Ways to Wisdom.